Okay, so you've brought us this uh, intense text, the Kitabi Aikwan. The Book of Certitude. Yeah, the Book of Certitude. And it's known for tackling this question that seems like it's plagued humanity for ages. Why do we seem hardwired to resist new prophets, even when we're actively anticipating a divine figure? We're talking 19th century Persia here. So the stakes were high. Yeah. And you know what's fascinating is how relevant that question remains even centuries later. I mean, this text isn't just some historical artifact, right? It speaks to a pattern we see throughout history, people clinging to their existing beliefs, even when they're confronted with something that challenges their worldview. It's like we're all waiting for a sign, but then we miss it because it doesn't match the picture we've created in our minds. And the book dives right in using examples like Noah, Moses, Jesus all figures who were desperately needed yet rejected by the very people they came to help. Why do we keep doing this? Well, the text argues it not because God is playing hide and seek with us, right? It's not about a lack of proof. It's about the, quote, veils that prevent us from seeing the truth. Think of them as blinders. Okay, so what are these veils exactly? How do they work? The Kitabi Iqwan describes them as our preconceived notions, worldly desires, even our blind trust in religious leaders. We become so attached to our current understanding, so blinded by what we think we know, that we fail to recognize truth even when it's staring us in the face. So it's not that the evidence is missing, it's that we're filtering it out. We're somehow blocking it. Can you give me an example? Like, how do these veils play out in a real-world scenario? Sure. The text offers a compelling example from the life of Muhammad. The changing of the Qibli, which is the direction that Muslims face during prayer. Right. Initially, Muslims prayed towards Jerusalem. But later, God instructed Muhammad to change the Qibli to the Kaaba in Mecca. Which makes sense, considering the Kaaba is the holiest site in Islam. Exactly. But here's where the veils come in. This seemingly small change, this shift in direction, caused major upset. Even many of Muhammad's dedicated followers were deeply disturbed. They began to question his prophecy, some even abandoning their faith altogether. Wow. So even those who were already following the prophet who believed in his message couldn't handle a change that disrupted their expectations. That's intense. Precisely. This perfectly illustrates the power of these veils. We become so fixated on outward forms and rituals that we miss the underlying essence, the deeper meaning they're meant to point to. So it's like we develop spiritual tunnel vision. We become okay. so focused on one specific interpretation, one narrow way of doing things, that we miss the bigger picture. Exactly. And the text suggests that this type of blindness affects religious leaders those in positions of authority even more acutely. Really? You'd think they'd be the ones with the clearest vision, right? They're the ones of all the theological training. And often that's the problem. The Kitabi Kwan criticizes those who cling to their own interpretations, their scholarly opinions, instead of approaching the divine word with an open heart and an open mind. They become so invested in their status as learned individuals, so attached to their positions of power, that they feel threatened by new truths that challenge their authority. That makes me think about the tension between divine knowledge and what we might consider regular human knowledge. And it sounds like this text is pretty direct in its critique of scholars who prioritize their own intellect over spiritual insight. It's important to remember that the text isn't anti-intellect. It's not saying that we should abandon reason or logic. Yeah. Rather, it's advocating for a different kind of knowing, a deeper understanding that arises from purifying our hearts and seeking guidance directly from the divine. So it's less about the amount of knowledge we accumulate and more about the quality of the container it's going into. Kind of like you could have the most exquisite teacup in the world, but if it's filled with dirt, you're not going to taste the tea. That's a fantastic analogy. <laughs> the Kintapi Quen emphasizes that true knowledge isn't simply about amassing information or memorizing scriptures. It's about refining our inner selves so that we're receptive to divine wisdom and then having the courage to act on it. Okay, this is where I get shipped up a bit. How does this text reconcile its claims with all the prophecies about the end times, the day of judgment? Because it seems to be implying that those things have already happened maybe multiple times. How is that even possible? This is where the Kitabi Kwan gets really interesting because it diverges from those traditional interpretations. It dives deep into biblical and Quranic verses about the end times, but it encourages a symbolic rather than the literal understanding. Symbolic? You mean it's not a literal planet exploding fire and brimstone kind of scenario? Not quite. The text proposes that these events, these descriptions of the end times, are actually describing the immense spiritual upheaval that occurs whenever a new prophet emerges. It's like a symbolic resurrection of souls, a shaking of our collective consciousness rather than a physical apocalypse. So each prophet brings about a mini day of judgment, like a cosmic system reboot for humanity's spiritual software. That's a great way to put it. 
The text uses the example of Jesus saying, quote, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's not talking about the literal physical earth crumbling. It's about old ways of thinking, outdated belief systems being overturned by a new spiritual reality. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. It's not about the world ending, but about the world profoundly changing with the coming of each prophet, which can feel pretty apocalyptic in its own right. Exactly. And this change, this spiritual resurrection, requires a radical shift in perspective. It requires us to release our rigid interpretations and embrace the constantly unfolding nature of truth. Which, let's be honest, sounds way more challenging than stocking up on supplies and waiting for the apocalypse. Perhaps. But the Kitabi Quen is encouraging us to look inward, not to the skies, to examine our own hearts, our own willingness to shed the veils that prevent us from recognizing the divine reality that's present in each moment. And that, according to this text, is the true meaning of resurrection. This is heavy stuff. You're saying humanity might have been misinterpreting these end times prophecies for centuries. Talk about information overload. This calls for a deep breath. When we return, we'll dive even deeper into the Kitabi Quen and unearth more of its hidden wisdom. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back. And I got to say, this concept of a symbolic resurrection, this idea that the world gets a spiritual reboot with each prophet, that's really sticking with me. It is a powerful image, isn't it? And it connects to another key idea in the Kitabi Quen, this concept of return. Yeah, the text keeps mentioning return. And I have to admit, I'm a little fuzzy on what it actually means. Yeah. Is it saying history repeats itself? Are we all just stuck in some cosmic loop? Well, it's a natural question, given how it can feel like we're seeing similar patterns, similar struggles throughout history. But the Kitabi Kwan isn't suggesting a literal reincarnation where souls are reborn into new bodies to relive the same experiences. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's describing a return of spiritual qualities and stations. Okay, so not a Groundhog Day situation where we're all just repeating the same mistakes over and over again, but more like certain spiritual archetypes keep reappearing throughout history. Like the same kinds of souls embodying the same virtues keep showing up at different points in time. Precisely. Yeah. The text suggests that the same divine attributes, the same core spiritual truths manifest in different messengers throughout time. Think of it like this. Prophets are like roses. Each rose is unique with its own particular beauty, its own fragrance, its own way of unfolding. But they all share those essential rose-like qualities, the softness of the petals, the delicate beauty, that underlying essence that makes them undeniably a rose. Wow, I love that analogy. So it's not so much about the individual prophet, their personality, their specific time period, but about the universal divine qualities they embody. It's like the message matters more than the messenger. Yes. And this idea leads to a really profound point, the essential unity of all prophets. The Kitabi Kwan draws on verses from different scriptures, from different faith traditions to illustrate this unity. It's saying that whether we're talking about Noah, Abraham, Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, they're all part of one continuous interconnected story. They're all reflecting different facets of the same divine reality. Whoa, that's a bold statement, especially considering how much division and conflict there's been between religions throughout history. I mean, you can't deny that different religions have different prophets, different scriptures, different interpretations of God. And that's exactly why this message, this emphasis on the underlying unity of all prophets is so radical and so needed, especially today. The Kitabi Kwan calls for a new way of understanding religion, one that transcends those surface level differences those historical and cultural interpretations, and recognizes the fundamental harmony at the heart of all genuine spiritual paths. So are you saying we need to abandon our own specific beliefs, our own religious traditions, and embrace this kind of vague, universal spirituality? It's not about abandoning your own faith or dismissing the practices that resonate with your soul. It's about recognizing that golden thread that connects them all, that shared divine source that animates and inspires all true religions. It's about approaching other faiths with a spirit of curiosity and respect, recognizing that they might offer us unique insights into the divine. Maybe it's about realizing that we're all on the same path, just walking different sections of it, and we all have something valuable to offer one another. Exactly. It's about shifting from a place of us versus them to a place of we. Imagine if we could truly see each other as fellow travelers on this spiritual journey rather than as rivals or competitors. That brings me back to something we touched on earlier, this idea of divine knowledge versus regular human knowledge. The text seems pretty critical of those scholars who cling to their own intellectual interpretations, almost like they're more invested in being right than in uncovering the truth. The Kitabi Kwan is directly addressing the dangers of intellectual arrogance, mm. the pitfalls of prioritizing ego over authentic spiritual seeking. 
It highlights this point with a fascinating story about a scholar who's busy criticizing other thinkers, but then when he's challenged to explain the Prophet Muhammad's mirage. Hold on, hold on, mirage. I need a quick refresher. Oh, uh, of course. Uh -huh. The mirage refers to Muhammad's miraculous night journey and ascension through the heavens. It's a mystical experience described in Islamic tradition. Right, right. Thank you. So the scholar is trying to explain the mirage and... And he completely fumbles it. Yeah. The text uses this anecdote to illustrate how even the most learned, the most outwardly devout, can be blinded by their own pride and limited thinking. They become so attached to their interpretations or intellectual frameworks that they miss the actual point. It's like they're using their knowledge as a shield, a way to deflect new ideas and protect their own sense of self-importance rather than as a tool for genuine exploration and discovery. Precisely. And that's why the Kitabi Kwan advocates for a completely different approach to knowledge, one rooted in humility and a sincere desire for understanding. It stresses the importance of purifying our hearts, letting go of those ego-driven desires so that we can become receptive to divine wisdom. So it's almost like instead of trying to cram more and more information into our minds, we need to do the opposite. We need to empty ourselves out and create space for something new to enter. That's a beautiful way to put it. The text emphasizes that true understanding isn't about mental gymnastics or intellectual domination. It's about spiritual transformation. It's an inner refinement that opens our hearts to guidance that's always available if we're willing to listen. And that makes me think about a line from the Kitabi Kwan that really struck me, quote, Knowledge is a light which God casteth into the heart of whomsoever he willeth. It's this idea that true knowledge, divine knowledge, isn't something we can force or control. It's a gift to grace, and we receive it only when we prepare ourselves when we cultivate the right conditions in our hearts. And those conditions, according to the text, are humility, sincerity, and a willingness to surrender our limited understanding to something greater. It's about recognizing that we don't have all the answers, and that's okay. It's about approaching the world with a beginner's mind with a sense of wonder and awe. It feels like such a countercultural message, especially in today's world where everyone is so quick to position themselves as an expert to have it all figured out. It is a challenging concept, no doubt. Go. But the Kitabi Khan is inviting us to consider a different way of being in the world, one where we're not defined by what we know, but by our willingness to learn to be transformed. It's about moving from intellectual arrogance to spiritual receptivity. It reminds me of that quote attributed to Socrates, quote, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. The deeper we go, the more we realize how vast and mysterious this reality truly is. Exactly. And that humility, that awareness of our own limitations is the starting point for real spiritual understanding. It's about approaching life, approaching other people, approaching the divine with curiosity and open-mindedness, ready to receive the gifts of wisdom that are always being offered if only we have the eyes to see them, the ears to hear them. Okay, so we've talked about these veils that blind us to truth, this symbolic interpretation of prophecies and this distinction between divine knowledge and human knowledge. But the Kitabi Kwan also dives deep into specific prophecies, particularly from the Bible and the Quran. There's a lot of focus on those verses about the Day of Judgment. And the text seems to be saying that those prophecies have been well misinterpreted for centuries. What's going on there? You're right. The Kintabi Kwan doesn't shy away from digging into the nitty gritty of scripture. And as you pointed out, it offers a radical reinterpretation of some of the most well-known prophecies, those verses that are often used to evoke fear and judgment. But remember, the text is urging us to move beyond a literal interpretation. These prophecies aren't about a physical apocalypse, but about the profound spiritual upheaval that occurs with the coming of each new prophet, each new revelation. Okay, so walk me through this. Let's take those verses about the Day of Judgment, for example. How does the Kitab Ikwan reimagine their meaning? It uses a few different approaches. One tactic is to highlight the symbolic language being used in these prophecies. For instance, it examines a verse from the Quran that reads, quote, what can such expect but that God should come down to them overshadowed with clouds? And I'm guessing that many traditional interpretations take that quite literally envisioning God descending from the sky surrounded by storm clouds. Precisely. But the Kitab i Kwan challenges that literal reading. It suggests that the clouds are symbolic. They represent the veils of human understanding, the preconceived notions, the worldly attachments, the fears and desires that prevent us from recognizing God's presence, which is already here all around us. So it's not about God physically descending from the heavens, but about us lifting our own veils, clearing away those mental and emotional obstructions so we can perceive the divine reality that's always been present. Exactly. It's a call to shift our perspective from the external to the internal. Instead of waiting for a dramatic outer event, 
we need to focus on our own inner transformation, on removing the clouds that obscure our vision. That's a powerful reinterpretation. Mm. Are there other ways that the Kitabi Ikwan approaches these prophecies? Another fascinating technique is to carefully analyze the context in which these prophecies were originally revealed. For example, it looks at those verses from the Bible that describe the signs of the coming Messiah. And it points out that many of those signs, those very specific descriptions, weren't literally fulfilled in the life of Jesus, as many Christians believe. So it's directly challenging those traditional Christian interpretations of those prophecies. Yes, and it's important to clarify that this isn't about discrediting Christianity or any other faith. The Kitabi Kwan is offering a broader, more nuanced perspective. It's suggesting that those signs, those descriptions, should be understood metaphorically as referring to the profound spiritual transformation that Jesus initiated, not as literal events. It argues that a purely literal interpretation can actually obscure the true significance of Jesus' message and lead to misunderstandings. So instead of focusing on whether or not Jesus fulfilled a checklist of prophecies, we should be paying attention to the deeper changes he sparked the spiritual awakening he inspired. Hmm. Instead of looking for a king on a physical throne, we should be seeking that spiritual kingdom within ourselves. Beautifully put. It's about recognizing the inner dimension of prophecy, the transformative power it can have on the human heart, rather than getting caught up in the literal details. This is really making me think differently about how I approach scripture. But I imagine some people might find these interpretations, especially the ones about the Day of Judgment, to be, well, a bit controversial. It's true that the Kitabi Kwan challenges many traditional viewpoints. But it's important to remember that it does so not to diminish other faiths, but to highlight what they share in common. It's offering a new lens through which to view religion a more expansive and inclusive understanding that embraces the essential unity of all these spiritual paths. And it does so by encouraging a more symbolic, less literal reading of scripture, a reading that prioritizes the underlying message of love, unity, and spiritual transformation. It's like instead of getting bogged down in the literal who, what, when, and where of these prophecies, the text is encouraging us to ask, what's the deeper message here? What's the universal truth that transcends time and culture? What is this text trying to awaken within me? That's a beautiful way to approach it. Yeah. That's why this text is so relevant, especially in our increasingly polarized world. It's calling for a more mature, more compassionate way of engaging with religion, one that recognizes the unifying spirit at the heart of all true faiths. And that's a message I think we could all benefit from reflecting on. But before we get too philosophical, let's take a quick pause. When we return, we'll explore the final takeaway from this deep dive into the Kitabi Kwan. Stay tuned. We're back. And wow, this deep dive into the Kitabi Kwan has really uh, shifted my perspective. It's like you start seeing those veils everywhere, those subtle ways we block ourselves from the truth without even realizing it. It's true, isn't it? They can be so ingrained, so habitual, that we don't even notice them until something or someone helps us to see them more clearly. And that's part of what this text is trying to do to help us recognize and remove those blinders so we can experience the world and ourselves with fresh eyes. And it's not just about recognizing those veils in ourselves, right? The Kitabi Kwan is also pretty direct about how these veils, these limiting mindsets, can affect religious leaders, the very people who are supposed to be guiding us toward the truth. It's a point the text emphasizes again and again. These veils aren't reserved for the uninitiated or the skeptical. In fact, the Kitabi Kwan suggests that religious leaders, those in positions of authority, might be even more susceptible to these blind spots, especially if they prioritize dogma and intellectual superiority over spiritual openness. Which makes me think about that story we discussed earlier, the one about the scholar who's so busy criticizing other people's interpretations that he misses the mark entirely when it comes to explaining the mirage. It's like his own pride becomes a barrier to true understanding. Exactly. And that story highlights a major theme of the Kitabi Kwan, the importance of purifying the heart as a prerequisite for true knowledge. It's not enough to simply accumulate information or engage in theological debates. Mm. Real understanding the kind that transforms us requires a shift in our inner landscape. So it's not about how much you know, but about the condition of the instrument you're using to acquire knowledge. It's like trying to play a beautiful piece of music on a piano that's horribly out of tune. You might hit all the right notes technically, but the music itself will be jarring and discordant. What a perfect analogy. The Kitabi Kwan is reminding us that true knowledge, divine knowledge, isn't just an intellectual pursuit. It's a spiritual practice. It requires us to cultivate the right qualities within ourselves. Humility, sincerity, a willingness to set aside our preconceived notions so that we can become vessels for a deeper wisdom. So how do we do that? How do we cultivate those qualities, especially in a world that often seems to reward the opposite ambition? 
self-promotion, always having the right answer. It's an ongoing practice, a lifelong journey of self-reflection and refinement. The Kitabi Kwan suggests that it begins with paying attention to our thoughts, our motivations, the subtle ways we might be clinging to ego or seeking validation through our beliefs. It's about asking ourselves, am I approaching this with genuine curiosity with an open heart? Or am I more invested in being right, in defending my position? That's a powerful question. And I think it speaks to a key distinction that this text highlights the difference between simply acquiring information and experiencing true spiritual understanding. You've hit the nail on the head. It's not about becoming walking encyclopedias of spiritual knowledge. It's about allowing that knowledge to penetrate our hearts to transform us from the inside out. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We've explored these veils that cloud our perception, the symbolic nature of prophecy, the importance of purifying our hearts, and this radical notion that all prophets are part of one interconnected story. But as we wrap up this deep dive, I have to ask, so what, what does all of this mean for our lives here and now? How do we take these profound but sometimes abstract ideas and apply them to our everyday experiences? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? The Kitab Chuan isn't just a theoretical treatise. It's a call to action an invitation to live our lives differently. And I think it offers us a few key takeaways. First, it reminds us that we're all on a spiritual journey, whether we realize it or not. We're all seeking truth, connection, and meaning, even if we express those longings in different ways. It's like we're all walking each other home to quote Ram Dass. Beautifully put. And that leads to the second takeaway. We need to cultivate compassion, both for ourselves and for others who are on this journey with us. We need to remember that everyone is at a different stage of understanding, and that's okay. We're all works in progress. So instead of judging or dismissing those who see things differently, we should approach them with curiosity, with a genuine desire to understand their perspective. Exactly. And that leads us to the third and perhaps most important takeaway. We need to stay open. We need to cultivate a posture of humility and receptivity, knowing that truth can reveal itself in unexpected ways, through unexpected messengers, and even in the most ordinary moments. It's like that line from the Kitabi Kwan, if all things reflect God's attributes as the text suggests, where might we be overlooking those signs in our own lives in the everyday world around us? What a powerful question to ponder. And that, I believe, is the essence of this deep dive. It's an invitation to pay attention to be present and to approach life as a sacred mystery filled with endless opportunities for learning growth and transformation. Thank you for guiding us on this incredible journey through the Kitabi Kwan. It's been challenging, illuminating, and ultimately deeply inspiring. And for you, dear listener, we hope this deep dive has sparked your curiosity, challenged your assumptions, and left you feeling a little more connected to that vast web of wisdom that connects us all. Until next time, keep seeking, keep questioning, and keep opening your heart to the infinite possibilities that unfold when we dare to lift the veils and see with fresh eyes.